Um, so thank you for um, inviting me to come and give this presentation today. Um, as John said, I will be talking about the strength of plate interiors and plate boundaries. Uh, it's going to have some uh, theoretical um, evaluation of rheology mostly. So it's a numerical model, but not really to the extent of the numerical models that we've seen before, which were um, much more sophisticated than what I'm going to look at. I'm kind of trying to distillate uh, some of the information to the science and see how it applies to large scale, uh, to understanding the mechanics of uh, plate tectonics at global scale. The picture on the background of this slide, of course, is uh, a, micro, um, a hand sample, actually of a shear zone from uh, Brittany in France. And it is important to me to always remember that the principles, the concepts that I'm going to be using to try to understand the variations of strength from one place to another, have to be grounded in the observations we do from these hand samples, from the geology, and all of these things that we heard about in great details for the last few days. So this is a reminder that the ideas, such as, for example, grain size reduction, which you will hear me talk about its effects several times, is really something that has been documented and has been thought of as being important in localized deformation based on those uh, field experiments. Uh, before really diving into what I, uh, I want to talk about, of course, um, this is not work that I'm doing by myself. Uh, there will be several sub-projects described here, which include many people at the University of Maryland, a student, Crystal Izquierdo, Osdot Kelly Addison, uh, Bear Hold and Ali Bahadori in uh, Stony Brook University. Greg Hearth is always there to us about uh, what we do wrong about rheologies. Um, Billy Shinova uh, is kind of, for me, the uh, temperature um, distribution master, and uh, Mike Hoskins about the judge of South Carolina. Southern California, because as has been maybe advertised the last few days, I will describe some of this inference about rheology and the community models that we are building for Southern California. So um, the evidence and try to, uh, information that I try to explain with these activities is the distribution and the diversity of strain area that we see at global scale. This is a, one of my favorite visualizations of plate tectonics. And what we see here, of course, is uh, plate interiors, which are shown in these white regions, um, meaning essentially non-deforming. This is a model in details. These were imposed at non-deforming regions, but the idea essentially is that there is not much we can um, document in terms of current geodetic um, deformation rate in those locations. You have the standard plate boundaries like mid-ocean ridges and um, the subduction zone transforms, which are evidently regions of very high strain rate, appearing in purple, red in this map. And we see also some other regions, which may be called, uh, which we may call um, diffuse plate boundaries in the oceans. There's a very famous one in the Indian Ocean between India and Australia here. Um, many of the continental deformation regions extend to fairly large distance are complicated with regions of higher and, and relatively lower strain rate, things that we ought to be explaining. So this diversity of strain rate from highly localized boundaries to more diffuse ones, some which have deformation uh, occurring at different length scales, these are the type of characters that we try to explain. And when I'm looking at the scale of the lit sphere, what I want to do is I, I'm not going to try to make a, a very highly detailed model like what uh, Thibault showed us the first day. But we are going to just try to understand what is the strength of the lit sphere and how it may vary from place to place with an eye towards ex explaining these observations here. So um, the approach is to construct strength envelope. Um, this is something a tool which is not necessarily perfect, but it gives us a overview of the strengths of a lithosphere. So I will not give in details all of the strengths envelope that we're building for different places, but essentially you always have this uh, brittle failure near the surface, which is mostly strain rate independent. We have ductal creep at greater depth. I'm using rheologies for uh, feldspar or olivine, depending on the exact environment that I'm looking at. Um, I do implement usually a saturation because I don't want values to be too high, but that is a very minor effect to the results I'm going to talk to you about. And of course, to construct these uh, envelopes, we need to know the rheology, so we need to know the rock types. We need to know the temperature, so um, we need to have some view about how temperature may be uh, changing with depth. Um, and we'll be showing some oceanic example where I'm using a conductive profile as well as continental lithosphere, which has just a steady state heat uh, balance solution. And then importantly, we're going to have to choose and find out about the strain rate. 
So we can calculate the strength envelope, but like I said, I want to have kind of an ensemble view of the lithosphere. So what I often will do, and, and Thibault again alluded to that the first day, is to integrate that strength envelope to its depth to get an idea about how much force is needed to deform the lithosphere at a certain rate. So be, uh, doing this integration and repeating it for different strain rate, we end up with essentially an effective rheology of this pile of lithosphere, which has essentially rock types uh, um, and, and temperature associated with it. We see here on the diagram on the right how this um, integrated strength varies with the uh, overall strain rate. And the first things that you got to see here is that it is really high, a highly nonlinear relationship, which means in this case that you can change the strain rate by many other orders of magnitude, and that strength changes somewhat, but not a huge amount. So in fact, the, the lines that you see there at the bottom are effective stress exponents, essentially the stress exponent that, is that would be helping us to understand this, um, to kind of represent this entire effective rheology. And you can see that in this case, this is for an oceanic, a fairly old oceanic lithosphere, you would have a stress exponent of the order of 30, a very large number like this, something which is getting closer to uh, a perfectly plastic material or things like this, although not exactly. This is already important for localization because essentially it tells you that if you change the force that is happening on this column of lithosphere by just a little bit of them, um, so you change the force by a little bit, you can have a large change in strain rate associated because the behavior is highly nonlinear. Some, and, and the reason why it's like this is because, of course, there's the entire brittle part of the lithosphere that has essentially an infinite stress exponent. The ductile part has stress exponent of the three or five. And once you have this integrated view, you have this balance between the two of them. I always prefer to think actually of the inverse of the stress exponents, but then not worry too much about it. The point is that on average, the behavior is going to have this very highly nonlinear um, behavior, a very large N. And this is something that actually I'm not, we're not the first one to talk about because there was a study a few years ago by Gordon and Hausman, which showed um, they looked at essentially the tectonic regime throughout that Indo-Australian plate. I told you there's a diffuse plate boundary there. And I found that the best representation of uh, focal mechanisms um, in the region is obtained when they have a geodynamic model of the plate being twisted by forces like subductions and mid-ocean ridges. Um, if they assume that this plate is viscous with an N of actually 30. In detail, it's a very, very comp different approach from what we're doing here, but the correspondence is that we need a highly nonlinear behavior of the lithosphere as a whole, and this N equals 30 is important. This, the thing, though, is that even with this highly nonlinear behavior, we are not expecting to localize the formation, which, of course, is the topic of this, um, of this uh, workshop, because you always need to increase the stress, increase the force, sorry, to increase the strain rate, which means that the energetically favorable configuration is actually a low force, low strain rate. To have localized deformation, we need to be able to, as we increase the strain rate, at least have the same amount of force, if not actually decreasing it. And for that, we need to use some additional feedback that goes beyond just taking that strength envelope and changing the strain rate that is applied to it. The first one of these feedback that we can consider is actually grain size. And we've seen many evidence. We all know that in local ashes on you have myelonite. They often call myelonites in the field. You have decrease of grain size. So here's that same strength of the um, lithosphere that I showed before. It's for an old one with a surface temperature gradient of 20 degrees per kilometer, relatively low strain rate. On the right panel, I showed the grain size that I assumed to build up this um, strength envelope. And it's constant at one millimeter, because why not? If I increase the strain rate, just like I mentioned, the stress increases everywhere. Therefore, the force requires to deform the lithosphere at this higher rate is larger than at a lower rate. This goes against localization. But if now I stay at larger strain rate, but I allow the, the grain size to equilibrate um, and to follow a piezometric relationship, I have this variation of grain size. And at this higher strain rate, the strength envelope looks something like the one that you see um, more strongly on the left panel. So essentially, the grain size has removed the effect of the higher strain rate. So we essentially trade off grain size reduction and higher strain rate. It essentially tells that we have approximately the same 
force required to deform a lithosphere of the same a temperature gradient, but a lithosphere with a coarse grain size at a slow rate, or a recrystallized grain size at a higher rate. And so this is actually a quantification of the overall effect of grain size reduction on the lithosphere. And of course, that's inspired by observations such as what uh, Jessica showed us the other day of um, melonites in an uh, oceanic lithosphere. Oops. Yeah. Um, so here I compare the effective energy for a one milligram, maybe one millimeter grain size throughout the lithosphere against the same calculation, assuming the grain size is at equilibrium with the Van der Waal kids meter relationship. Details, you know, you can change them; it doesn't change the story. That if you compare those two um, models of the lithosphere at the same force, you have an increase in the strain rate by about a factor of seven hundred which means that we can actually explain with this process, maybe the difference between a plate interior to, with maybe a, um, a diffuse plate boundary, which deforms at about a, a strain rate about a thousand times larger than a plate interiors. There are other things we can play with in the oceanic lithosphere to explain the even more localized uh, plate boundaries that we see, uh, for example, in mid-ocean ridges. And one thing we can play with is um, actually, the temperature, I told you this was an old lithosphere with a surface gradient of 20 uh, Kelvin per kilometer. If I compare it with the strength of a much younger lithosphere and therefore much hotter lithosphere, then I see that for the same force, I can have a much, much, much larger uh, strain rate. I, so again, an equivalent strain um, force. The idea essentially is the same thing that a lot of people do in the lab to en enhance stress you have a force balance to the region. You have an old region of lithosphere, which is fairly cold and thick, and for the same force, but now if you put next to it a region which is very hot and thin, that whole force is concentrated, so you have a higher stress, which essentially makes you go to a much higher strain rate. So the, the contrast of age across the lithosphere is essentially, a, can be seen as a stress concentrators that provides very high, much higher strain rate in the mid-ocean ridge environment. So this force balance idea can actually explain the range of strain rates that we see in the oceans. Of course, the temperature structure itself is a result of plate tectonic processes. So it's a little bit of a chicken and egg there. The system is self-consistent. We know that, but how can you force it to be? How can you essentially with change the rheology of, the, um, of this old lithosphere in a way that is going to make it um, weak enough to deform at a fast rate and now have uh, end up in this uh, new um, lithosphere, very thin plate, etc. We heard a couple of times to, uh, over the week about serpentinization, and I think this is really a key towards uh, actually forming these plate boundaries in the oceanic environment. If not only when we're looking at the great evidence that um, Jessica showed us um, from the Prison and Old paper. Um, about involvement of serpentinization and uh, hydrated minerals or shear zones in the oceans, but it has an effect that is sufficient even at the scale of the lithosphere to localize the formations in the level that we see in plate boundaries. Serpentinization is known to be occurring in places like that diffuse plate boundary in the Indian Ocean I keep on talking about. It is also inferred uh, to be important in subduction zone environment. So let's see what it does in terms of the uh, rheology of the lithosphere. So we go with, uh, it's not exactly the same, but almost the same uh, model as before, the strength envelope as before with a regions not near the surface that's gonna be serpentinized. And the effect of serpentinization, it can be several fold, but one of them is that it's gonna, the um, frictional resistance of uh, serpentinized rock tends to be lower than non-serpentinized rock. And so we essentially decrease the strength in, in the near surface region of the lithosphere where dominated by the brittle regime, which enables us to, which is actually compensate for the increase of stress needed to go to a, a higher deformation rate in the ductal regime. So overall, the lithosphere has about the same integrated strength, but we traded near surface brittle strength to deeper ductile resistance, um, which comes from increasing, in this case, the strain rate by three orders of magnitude. So separatization can give us essentially the same effect overall as grain size reduction in that old lithosphere. And then 
we can combine it with grain size reduction so that now we have the new line there where we again have traded from coarse grain to fine grain by, uh, and increased the strain rate in contrast so that we can actually get to even more effects and therefore um, from, without having touched on the temperature at all, we can have an increase of several of the six of the magnitudes here, the, the type of strain rate that we're looking at. Certainly something that will, put, that will correspond to localized deformation at lithospheric at plate scale. So um, in terms of the effective rheology, this is essentially what we're looking at. We start with an old non-sympathetonized coarse uh, lithosphere, sympathetonizing it increased by almost two orders, three orders of magnitudes deformation rate, and then recrystallizing in the mantle the part that evidently is not serpentinized, serpentinized help us go to a couple other, um, couple additional um, orders of magnitude in um, strain rates. So in the oceanic lithosphere, these principles essentially can be used to explain at, it, at the lithosphere scale, the variety, uh, diversity actually of um, strain rate observed uh, or inferred, because of course in the oceans, it's mostly an inference um, throughout the oceanic plates. Now, onto the continents, can we use the same type of processes to understand localization of deformation in the continent, formation of uh, plate boundaries and all these type of things? I will be focusing uh, mostly on Southern California because it's a very well studied place thanks to the efforts of the South, Southern California Earthquake Center, SCAC, over several decades now. Um, it's also a very complex region with many faults, uh, many blocks of different origins as we can see on the maps, both on the left and on the right. Uh, I will um, describe a little bit more uh, what we're doing in here. And so some of the questions we can talk about, uh, ask here is, does this lithological variety, the different rock types we see in different places, did that play a role in explaining, again, the localization and where the major uh, shear zones are in this particular location? This is an, um, part of the effort led by SCAG of producing a community rheology model for the region. It's an effort, as was mentioned yesterday, I think, led by Liz Hearn. It combines a community thermal models, and there's a version by Wayne Tatra and one version by Billy Shinovada we're using, a geological framework telling us what rock type is present where that Mike Hoskins is leading, and then rheological inferences from um, Greg Earth and that I am certainly participating in. So we can take all of these regions here. For each one of them, we can construct this type of uh, strength envelope that I described before. And for now, I'm going to be very simple. The crust is only going to have first bar rheology. The mantle only are going to have olivine rheology. We want to make this more complicated, and I'll show you some uh, of the effects in a few minutes. But that's um, uh, that is work in progress. Um, at this point, at every location, we can have a temperature model thanks to Billy Shinovar's work. Uh, we're using crustal thickness from Shannon Ritzwaller. And for each one of those places, then we take the strength envelope, integrate it with depth, repeat the uh, exercise with strain rate to produce an effective rheology at every point in the lithosphere there. Uh, you can see that it's a bit not less nonlinear than uh, in the oceans, and that's because we have more ductal regimes, so low N compared to the brittle parts, and that's okay. Um, but we, uh, so that's, that's what we have now. For each one of those points, rheology is not enough. We're going to essentially make a, an evaluation of what the stress level should be, in which case that enables us to pinpoint what the strain rate should be just from this rheological uh, information, or equivalently, we express it in terms of viscosity, which most people find uh, more intuitive to understand. The stress model comes from uh, Bahadori and Holt. Um, they've taken um, strain rate observed in the entire region, topography, find what would be the deviatoric stress if you just take compensation at 100 kilometer of, um, of the difference crustal thickness and topography in the region. We have average stresses of um, 10 to 20 megapascals for most of the region with these variations, not, of, with, not all of those variations is really that realistic, but it is, um, this is actually a model that, they are working, that they, we, they are, we are working with at this point. The panel on the top here does show us that this is work in progress, let's remember. Um, we are a little bit more active than the guy sitting on his rock there. Um, combining those two, we have a geodetics uh, derived estimates of viscosity. And now we can take the same strain rate and our rheological model to end up with a rheology uh, derived estimates of, um, of viscosity. 
And there are evidently some difference. There's some difference in the granularity that we're looking at. Uh, we had to use actually the weakest assumption of a weak biology and um, um, a recrystallized uh, grain size throughout the lithosphere to produce this map. But it has some characters that do seem to match what we actually observed uh, inferred geodynamically and some that don't, which is always interesting. The big thing, of course, is that region here at Sierra Nevada is very strong. It is not deforming. We know this region is supposed to be quite cold, although the model is probably making it colder than it really should be. But at any rate, the temperature difference from one region to another seems to be important in terms of understanding why we have these zones of deformation along San Andreas and in Eastern California. Um, other places we don't agree. Like in the Great Basin, um, the geodynamics would tell us it is strong. Um, the rheology would tell us it is weak. And so here, really, the key is to remember that we have not included yet in this model lithological variations. There's a lot of different rock types in the regions. And if we start to use them and say we have different rheology at different places because we have different rock types, then we should be able to go one step further. Um, now, to do this very well, we don't have experiments from every single rock type in the region, so we have to start making up rheologies. So we've been using um, mixing theories, um, both kind of traditional ones and by all, to try to evaluate for each rock type what its flow law should be. And there we'll mostly show you the results if we assume this kind of um, distributed microstructures, not in actual shear zones, but more in the bulk between shear zone and between boundaries. So that region up there, the um, Great Basin, actually turns out to have a basement, a lower crust, which is thought to be more rich in basalts than, any, than uh, what I had assumed up to now. And we can see that from this made up rheology and the mineralogical estimates of uh, Mike Hoskins, this should actually be a larger, a much stronger region. So that essentially should ex help us explain why we have this difference. Um, between biological and geodynamic inferences of viscosity here. We can use alternative mixing models, which will give us an idea about the shear zone and get an idea about how much weaker the boundaries between the blocks would be. Um, and one of the inferences actually which is interesting is that if we look at one particular block, and don't worry too much, the various columns you see on the right are for different mixing models. Um, we have strengths that has actually a big jump at the depth there at about 25 kilometers in the case of the Mojave block. And I call this a rheological moho because the actual moho is five kilometers deeper, but this is where we start to have that basaltic layer, gabbroic layer, sorry, uh, underlying a much more felsic mid crust. So we have, um, so these are the type of things that we need to really think about when you think about the, the lithosphere. Um, to finish up, uh, some more things that is currently um, that we're currently working on is to add some information that we don't have actual con a lot of constraints for, like what is the grain size at depth throughout the regions? We just don't have that information. So we started to make models of grain size evolution forced essentially by the faults that we see in the region. This is work that Katie Addison has been doing with me. And uh, from these models of forced localization with grain size evolution, we have enhanced displacement rate, strain rate, underneath the fault, like very much something like a shear zone. We have prediction of variations of grain size, which would be something that maybe can be compared to axiom faults, uh, shear zone. And what's important is that this really leads us to three different definitions of what a shear zone is, either from the structure, that would be the blue one showing where grain size is small, or from uh, kinematics, the red one tells us where the strain rate is very high. So geodesy and structural geology could actually be sensitive to different definition of shear zone. And it's something that we need to figure out and learn about, uh, very, that. that we need to learn about very well. Importantly, these models do not produce finer uh, scale structures. So something that we need to evidently work about. And maybe to do this, we need to dive even further into the unknown. There's a lot of additional processes that have been mentioned throughout the week. Uh, we don't have all of them, far from them. But it may be that it is the interaction between all of those processes that produce the richness of um, structures that we see in the field that have been shown in some of the posters and some of the talks. And that we kind of want to include that to really understand the structure of especially the continental lithosphere and the influence of plate boundaries. So these are uh, the key points uh, that I'm not going to repeat here because maybe I just want to leave them up uh, in case we have some questions.
Thank you, Laurent. And for everyone, um, please go ahead and type your questions into the chat. All right, there, the first one is from John Arthur. And um, he says, in a very jelly sandwich lithosphere with weak decoupling levels, when should we expect surface strain rates to no longer be representative of, de of deeper deformation? Never. You should not expect the surface strain rate to be representative of the deeper deformation. Uh, we do that, we use a uh, uniform strain rate with depth because we don't have any better constraints. But it is clear that this is a big oversimplification, especially like you said, and that will be the case in the continents where you have many decoupling layers. As many people um, know, decoupling actually transfers stress, but not strain rates. So um, we may want to repeat this type of exercise we do with strength profile produce um, more like you know uniform strength uniform stress instead of uniform strain rate um, uh, strength envelope in a way. It would not be a strength envelope, but you see what I mean. But you're right, this is a huge uh, assumption. I actually had a very similar question in that, um, um, in that, so for example, from the models of Anthony Tutu and Berhard Steinberger, they actually did th global 3D calculations of the stress field. And so maybe that would be an interesting place to start where you actually apply a depth dependent stress instead of having a uniform stress. Yeah, absolutely. That's something to look into. I would say, though, that we try to use as much of the local information we can tell from uh, the geology, especially for the California case. And so um, I don't think that level of details is possible in a global 3D model. There is another question from Thibaut Duretz, and, and he says, Laurent, do you assume strike slip compression or extension to construct your rheological strength envelopes? Um, I can change that. All the one I used here use strike slip uh, because it's kind of the intermediate assumption for the brittle part. And also because it's quite appropriate for a strike, uh, strike slip boundary like in Southern California. Uh, we had discussion earlier about um, finding places that are not strike slip for um, as kind of community field sites. That's very interesting. But evidently strike slip has uh, a big advantage that the, the rocks don't have same kind of exhumation and, and um, so this type of history. So in terms of their history, it may be a little bit simpler to unravel. A question no. from Marco Herwig, and it says, how close are we coming with mixing laws and members to real, to real polymineralic rheology where the interactions between phases are becoming important, being not implemented in the end member flow laws? So I actually, okay, so when we use our polymineralic um, mixing there, and I'm not the first one to see that's been shown in the UA paper in particular. Um, we are very close to the few cases where the, the rock has also been tested in lab. There's some variations in there. There's certainly not a perfect match, but actually I think compared to the uncertainty in the end member flawless, the mineralic flawless to start with, we are essentially in the right ballpark. I don't think we can make a very precise uh, estimate and also don't think we should look for a very precise estimate because there's a lot of interpolation when we go from the lab to even those flow loads. So I think we are as close as we're going to get for a long time and at least at the scale I'm looking at, I'm not talking about a specific outspot, at the scale I'm looking at, this is all we need. We are, we are good in that respect. A question from Lucas Fuchs, and then maybe we'll just answer one more question after that. Does your brittle strength depend on the grain size as well? And if so, how do you define that? It does not. It's um, straight old uh, um, by this law or um, equivalently pu uh, published for serpentine, especially by Greg's group. The last question will be from Lyle Harris. And he says, I realize you later showed results for different rock types, but why was um, an orthocyte, i.e. feldspar rheology, initially used to model continental crust when granitoids containing quartz, whose rheology is sensitive to the presence of water, dominate the crust. You're right, and they also contain much uh, stronger um, minerals. I did not show this. Uh, we actually had, um, we followed different uh, assumptions about wet or dry rheology, and we ended up needing the, the weaker one. The point about trying to replace this the point you're making there is exactly why we are trying to replace the just using first power biology, which is done by a lot of people. Um, we try to replace that approach by actually making up the rheology for the specific rocks we think happen in that particular place. So we try to get out of that assumptions.
But not every rock type has a rare energy that is well determined in the lab, which is why uh, we have to resort in this imperfect but fairly satisfactory mixing mode. 